I'm going to take the opportunity to uh, make a few comments and give you some perspective on why I am so excited about the prospects for cell therapy for macular degeneration. A bit of history here. Around about 10 years ago, when Alan Trounsen and I were in Melbourne, along with uh, a young Israeli physician, Ben Rubinoff, and uh, 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 Singaporean embryologist, Eric Bongzo, we were able to make some of the first human embryonic stem cell lines. And when Ben was in the lab, he made a very important observation, and that was this, that when he let those stem cells spontaneously differentiate or begin to turn into specialized cells, uh, he could identify cells in those cultures that were very much like neural stem cells isolated from the brain. Uh, and these are remarkable cells. Uh, we learned how, how to induce them and how to make them very effectively in time. And they really do uh, resemble the cells in the embryo that are precursors to all the cells in the brain and spinal cord. And they even form these tube-like structures similar to something called the neural tube, which is the, that forms the whole neural axis in the embryo. Uh, and uh, we learned how to make these efficiently, and we were studying their differentiation or how they specialized. And you can see here they're, they're starting to crawl out. You see these little feet onto the culture dish. And uh, one of my students uh, called Gary Pay noticed uh, that oftentimes he'd get these types of cells growing out from them. And this is a very, very distinctive cell with a very distinctive uh, appearance, and it is what it looks like. This is retinal pigment epithelium, the cell uh, that degenerates uh, in the condition we're talking about today. Now, we couldn't really pursue this uh, down in Melbourne because we didn't have the right people around us, but uh, when I came uh, to USC, uh, I learned about our Doheny Eye Center and Institute and uh, Mark Humayan uh, and my colleague David Hinton and uh, uh, their expertise, and uh, we got together uh, with David and uh, really just pointed his lab in the right direction, um, told him how to make the neural precursors, and with the help of the seed grant, uh, he's really made remarkable process, uh, progress in, uh, in uh, uh, directing cells uh, down this pathway. And David will tell you about that, but I think the most remarkable thing about these particular cells is this, that often when we make specialized cells uh, from embryonic stem cells, they're the right cell type, but they're not quite mature. So heart cells or insulin-producing cells look more like fetal cells rather than adult cells when we make them from embryonic stem cells. And so they're not totally functional. With this cell type, it seems to be an exception. We can make cells that are very, very similar to what are seen in, in the adult eye. And, you know, this is a clearly an international effort. There's been great progress at the University of Washington with our colleagues at UC Santa Barbara, and also my long-standing uh, friend and colleague, Peter Andrews, in the UK working with Peter Coffey uh, at the uh, Moorfields Eye Institute. We've all come to the same conclusion, that it is feasible to make the right cell type uh, to treat this disease. And for a number of clinical considerations that Mark will tell you about, uh, it is a great opportunity as well. So without uh, any further comments, I'll introduce uh, David Hinton, who's a, a fantastic cell biologist who specializes in the, in the retina. He'll tell you about his progress. Uh, good morning, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with you today. So as we heard, uh, age-related macular degeneration affects the back of the eye where the retina is located, and in particular, that macular region right here. But the primary site of pathology is at the really outer aspect of the retina, which is here, the retinal pigment epithelium, the adjacent vascular choroid, and a very thickened basement membrane between the RPE and the choroid. And this is looking at a histologic section of the retina, and we can see here where the photoreceptors are and these are their light-sensitive outer segments. Here is the retinal pigment epithelium in very close proximity to these outer segments, and there's that basement membrane, Brooks membrane, and then the choroid. Now, the RPE layer is really essential for maintaining the health of the light-sensitive photoreceptors, and if the RPE in the macula are lost, then the photoreceptors die and central vision is lost. Now we're looking at really high magnification of this site. This is where this early pathology of AMD is occurring. You can see these pigmented retinal pigment epithelial cells, the thick Brooks membrane, and these spaces are the vascular choroid that 
supply nutrition to the outer retina. This is using a transmission electron micrograph. And we can now see that the reason why the RPE cell is pigmented is because it has all these melanin granules within it. You can also see here, these are the outer segments of the photoreceptors, this really intimate interaction between the retinal pigment epithelium and the photoreceptors. It's really essential for the health of the photoreceptors that they have normally functioning polarized retinal pigment epithelium. And every day, these photoreceptors shed part of their outer segments and the RPE cells phagocytose them. If that doesn't happen, the photoreceptors will degenerate. So as we've heard, in age-related macular degeneration, the early phase can progress to either of two late stages of the disease. One form, exudative or wet form of the disease, has got abnormal growth of blood vessels under the retina. And fortunately, there's now a very effective therapy for this form of the disease based on inhibition of the growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor. On the other hand, this form of AMD, atrophic or late dry form of AMD, uh, has no effective therapy at this point. So this is where we're putting our efforts. So atrophic AMD is characterized by these extracellular deposits that you see here around the macula. They're termed drusen. The, photo, the, um, AMD, the RPE cells themselves accumulate lipofusion and start to degenerate. They first atrophy, they can undergo cell death, and if large areas of RP cells undergo cell death, we get a, an area called geographic atrophy. And I'll just show you an example of that. This is where the macula was, and all the RPE cells within this region have died, leaving this geographic area of RPE loss with subsequent loss of photoreceptors. So this patient would have loss of their central vision. So the loss of vision in atrophic AMD is due to the death or irreversible damage to the retinal pigment epithelium and then the photoreceptors. Fortunately, the neural output of the retina is relatively preserved in atrophic AMD. Therefore, cell replacement therapy of RPE and potentially photoreceptors is a reasonable option for restoring patients with severe atrophic AMD. And replacement of RPE in areas of early photoreceptor degeneration may be the most straightforward and effective method to slow the progression of atrophic AMD. Human embryonic stem cells represent a potentially unlimited source of cells for such replacement therapy. So what stem cell um, populations should be used for atrophic AMD therapy? Well, there's a number of things that need to be considered. First of all, we have to consider what the source of the stem cell population is, the cell type to be transplanted, would we transplant RPE cells, photoreceptors, or both? What is the state of the differentiation of the cells? Do we want them terminally differentiated, or do we want them in more of a precursor state? Do we want to use cell suspensions, or do we want to use cell sheets? And then finally, what's most important is what is the potential of these cells, once they're differentiated, to functionally integrate into the retina. So a, a number of people have looked at a variety of cell types which they think have potential for uh, treatment of age-related macular degeneration, and these include neural progenitor cells derived from prenatal cortical brain tissue, retinal progenitor cells from the ciliary margin, which I'll talk about in a minute, retinal progenitor cells from postnatal retina, a type of glial cell in the retina called Mueller glial cell, bone marrow-derived stromal cells, human embryonic stem cells, and induced pluripotent stem cells. So there was really a lot of excitement just over nine years ago when retinal stem cells were first reported in the ciliary margin right here in the front of the eye of the mammalian eye. However, in our opinion, these cells have limited proliferative potential, and in order to access them, you'd have to do a surgical procedure to remove these cells from the eye, and it might be very difficult to obtain adequate numbers for AMD therapy. Others have focused on using multipotent self-renewing stem cells isolated from postnatal neural retina or fetal brain. However, there's always a real concern of a potential inherent risk for tumor formation if you transplant non-terminally differentiated cells into the retina. 
So at the Broad CIRM Center at USC, we focused our attention on utilizing highly differentiated RPE cells from human embryonic stem cells right now and perhaps induced pluripotent stem cells in the future. So as far as a cell-based therapy for dry AMD, derivation of pure populations of differentiated RPE from human ES cell lines has been reported from multiple labs over the past five years. In our studies, embryonic stem cell aggregates are cultured and then plated uh, in a special neuronal uh, differentiation media for three days uh, to form embryoid bodies. And then these are grown in RPE differentiation media for another eight to 12 weeks. And we see that we get this outgrowth of retinal pigment epithelial cells. You can see these pigmented cells here growing out adjacent to other cells. And these can be cut away, dissected away, and you end up with pure cultures of retinal pigment epithelial cells. So what's the evidence that these cells that look like RPE cells really are RPE cells? Well, they arise at a time when other neural cells are differentiating. They, inform, they form intact monolayers, just like the normal RPE layer is. They can be polarized, like normal RPE cells, with apical tight junctions, microvilli, and melanin pigment. They can specifically phagocytose rod outer segments of photoreceptors. They express RPE-specific genes, and in animal models, injection of these cells can rescue retinal degeneration. Now, it's a real critical feature of the normal function of RPE cells that they're polarized. And here's looking at an explant. So this is a normal explant of the eye. And we can see here the retinal pigment epithelial cells. And if we look at the surface of these cells with a scanning electron micrograph, you can see one cell here, another one here, another one here, and these are all the microvilli on the surface. So these are the ones that are in contact with the other segments of the photoreceptors. On a transmission EM, we see the RP, normal RPE cell, apical microvilli, and then melanin granules, and we can see that these cells are joined with each other by tight junctions. So this is the normal monolayer. In the past, previous investigators have chosen to use single-cell suspensions of human ES-derived RPE for subretinal transplantation in animal models. However, we strongly believe that in order for the RPE to function normally, they must have this polarized phenotype. So we've developed a method for inducing the growth of cultured ES-derived RPE to form highly differentiated, polarized RPE monolayers using a transwell culture system with a specialized defined media. And using this method, HES-derived RP cultures become highly pigmented as the polarization develops. These HES-derived RPE can be differentiated into intact, highly differentiated monolayers with apical microvilli. So here's the scanning EM picture again on the surface, and here's one RP cell, another one, another one, and you can see the apical microvilli on the surface here at higher magnification, very similar to what we saw in the normal eye explant. And we're very happy to see that this image of these cells was chosen to be part of the 2009 CIRM calendar, and we were February. <laughs> so the polarized human ES-derived RPE cells also show apical pigment. So these are the ones derived from ES cells. So we have apical pigment, we have apical microvilli, and we have tight junctions and tight junction proteins. So it's very similar to the normal situation. Importantly, we don't want these cells to proliferate once if they were to be placed into a patient because uh, we, we want them to remain as an intact monolayer. So when we've looked at these cells, we see that they do not proliferate and they remain in G1 phase of the cell cycle. This is a marker where there's a nuclear antigen for cells that are not in cell cycle and you can see that they're all positive. Human ES cells also derive or generate their own extracellular matrix. So remember, they sit on Brooks' membrane. So in order to attach to that, they need to make an extracellular matrix. And you can look at this ECM underlying the human ES-derived RPE, and they have a lot of similarity to the extracellular matrix in Brooks' membrane. 
Now, we also wanted to have functional tests of these cells. So do they do what they're supposed to do? Do they phagocytose the rod outer segments? And so we developed an assay in order to do that. Here are the human ES-derived RPE differentiated into a monolayer. And these are green labeled rod outer segments. Inside the RPC, RPE cells, we see uh, lysosomes, which are labeled red. So we can, this is where the, um, the rod outer segments are degraded within the cell. So we add these uh, green uh, rod outer segments to the RPE cells. They attach to the surface, and then they are internalized, so you can see the green ones inside the cell. Then they fuse with the lysosomes and turn yellow. So green plus red equals yellow. So this is the process of phagocytosis. If we look at the actual cells after six hours after feeding, we see the green rod outer segments and we see the red lysosomes. But after 20 hours, you can see that most of these, or many of these, are yellow, showing that the rod outer segments were internalized into the lysosomes. Another really important uh, feature of RPE cells is their growth factor secretion. A normal RPE show polarized secretion of growth factors such as PEDF and VEGF. And especially pigment epithelium-derived growth factor is very important. It's anti-angiogenic and it's neuroprotective. And we predicted that PEDF secretion from polarized confluent HES-derived RPE would be much higher than that secreted by non-polarized RPE, RPE suspensions. So while non-polarized RPE secrete only very small amounts of PEDF, polarized HES-derived RPE secrete massive amounts of PEDF. This is the LISA assay of, a, of the supernatant fluid the cells are growing in. Well, these are the cells themselves, and this is an assay for PEDF. Look here, these are the non-polarized HES-derived RPE. There's hardly any secreted. This is the polarized. There's a massive increase in secretion. Inside the cells themselves, these are just human embryonic stem cells. These are non-polarized ones, and here's the ones that are polarized. Again, a massive upregulation of PEDF. So we've determined that polarization plays an important role in determining the pattern, and even more importantly, the extent of secretion of PEDF. And these very high apical levels of PEDF may promote an anti-angiogenic outer retinal environment and neural protection of the photoreceptors. So we don't have to manip manipulate these cells in any way once we get them in a polarized state to protect the retina. So what's the feasibility of doing uh, HES, RPE, cell replacement therapy in AMD? Well, we're going to hear next from Mark Humayan, who's going to talk about instrumentation and surgical techniques that are currently available for subretinal delivery of these cell sheets. And also, polarized RPE can be grown on an either biocompatible, biodegradable, or non-biodegradable porous membranous supports. So here's our idea of what could potentially be done in the future, is you could grow RPE cells, polarize them, and then implant them in patients with geographic atrophy to prevent the progression of the disease. At the Broad Serm Center, as well, keratinocytes from individuals are now being induced to form IPS cells in collaboration with Wangi Liu. And we're now looking at protocols for differentiating these cells into RPE. Now multiple labs, uh, including our collaborators from UC Santa Barbara, are reporting the differentiation of RPE-like cells from murine and human IPS cells. So why not just use induced pluripotent stem cells instead of uh, a prototypic uh, human ES-derived cell line. Well, the feasibility of consistently developing IPS lines without use of viral vectors from elderly AMD patients and then differentiating them into functional RPE is really still under investigation. Immune rejection using established human ES-derived RPE cells may in fact not even be a major problem because of the site that we're placing the cells in the subretinal space. And why do we have reasons for optimism? First of all, there's low MHC expression on human ES-derived retinal cells, so they're less likely to be rejected. There's a small a paucity of dendritic cells, which are cells which help to promote the local immune response. The subretinal space is an immune privileged site, and there's a very low level of rejection uh, that we've found of RPE cells in our current animal experiments. 
More recently, methods have been developed to differentiate photoreceptor cells from ES cells, and even in the last month from IPS cells. And so one could envision sometime in the future that you could use ES cells or IPS cells to differentiate RPE cells, make them in a monolayer, also use the ES cells to differentiate into photoreceptor cells, and then get those to differentiate perhaps in vitro to form photoreceptors like this. And then this combined construct could then be implanted in this patient with geographic atrophy to actually replace the outer retina. But we think that this is a long, long way away. And so why, why do we believe that you can't do this right now? Well, we, we know that cells with photoreceptor characteristics can be differentiated from human ES cells and IPS cells. However, in order for this to work, these cells would need to integrate into the damaged AMD retina with appropriate alignment and differentiated morphology of the cells. And most challenging would be the integration of the photoreceptors into the retina, because there you have to get uh, synapse formation. Uh, also, these uh, photoreceptors would have to be appropriately aligned such that the RP cells would phagocytose the rod outer segments in a, normal, in a normal way. And finally, we'd have to be able to do this in such a way that we get functional recovery of vision. So as time reported how the coming revolution in stem cells could save your life, we believe that stem cells could save your sight. And these are some of the people that were involved in doing these projects. In particular, I want to point out uh, Dan Hong Zhu, who's here, because she's responsible for essentially all of the in vitro work that I presented to you today. And I'd also point, like to point out the critical support that we've had from CIRM uh, with the Leon uh, J. Thal Seed Grant Program. Thank you very much. <laughs>